Good afternoon. Is everybody here? Obviously. So the purpose of a university is to create knowledge. We are all involved in the creation of knowledge uh, through research. The curation of knowledge, the protection of knowledge, the, um, the repository of knowledge. So we're the people that uh, that, uh, that, that remember what knowledge was created because if there's a zombie apocalypse, we wanna make sure that all of the knowledge still exists. That's one of the roles of the university. The third principal role of the university, um, and these are all equal roles, is of course to transmit knowledge uh, through teaching, lecturing, publications, and, uh, and other forms of outreach. Now, a critical part of the teaching enterprise involves all of you in this room, and that is teaching assistantships. So what, uh, what is a teaching assistantship? How many of you have TA'd before? Okay, and those of you, that's most of you, those of you who don't have your hands up will probably TA in the near future. Probably is even a requirement of your degree program and uh, for a lot of good reasons. So what is a teaching assistantship? It has multiple functions. The one that you're probably most familiar with is that it provides support for graduate student researchers. So if you are lucky enough to be on a fellowship, um, there's not necessarily a requirement, a financial requirement to teach, although you may still want to do it for one reason or another, and also your degree program will, will require it. Um, if you're PI, PI by the way, I used that word before, not everyone knew what that meant. PI means principal investigator, which means professor. In the world of research, sometimes we use the word PI. Uh, so the, uh, the, the PI doesn't have to pay the graduate student in the quarters in which they, uh, they are a TA. It reinforces the knowledge of the course material with the teaching assistant. So have you ever had the, the, the experience of not truly understanding something until you have to transmit it to some, somebody else? And also when you're up in front of a group of 10 or more people and you're saying something and it's not making any sense, it's immediately obvious that not only is your explanation or my explanation not that good, but maybe if my explanation is not that good, it means I don't really understand it as well as I ought to in order to be able to transmit it most effectively. So our fellow humans, particularly the people in our classes, are very good at, at telling us when we are not doing our jobs, uh, our jobs well. And it provides uh, relief to the faculty member. So. Um, while grading papers is not the most fun activity that a TA can, uh, can do, um, the, you, can, you can rest assured that the professor has graded a lot of papers in the past. Uh, and this is the, kind of like a, a little bit of a rite of passage. Everybody turns the crank at some point. And if your professor is a really, uh, really good uh, person, they will grade the, the tests with you. And there may be pizza involved. All right, there are three types of TA, and this is how it kind of works at UCSD. Every department is a little bit different, but in general, there are full-time uh, te teaching, teaching assistantships, and they are 20 hours per week. Part-time is 10 hours per week, and a reader, which is also known as a grader, is uh, also 10 hours per week. How does the accounting work in a university system? The TA allocations are given to the departments based on the number of undergraduates enrolled in that department. So the number of undergrads, they get some allocation of uh, TA ships to that department, and then the department has to come up with the rules for how many, uh, how many students in a class constitutes a need for TAs in units of half-time TAs. So typical in the engineering school at UCSD is 10 hours of TA support per 40, hour, or 40 uh, students enrolled in a class. 
Usually, depending on where you are, either before or after advancing to candidacy, the TA ship doesn't necessarily cover the full GSR uh, stipend, but a PI can supplement from a, from a grant, but only if the grant is a certain type of, of, of grant with minimal restrictions. So I would suggest that you communicate with your PI at the quarters that you TA um, in order to discuss whether or not there may or may not be a, uh, a discrepancy between the TA support and your normal GSR support. So my, before becoming a professor, so I, I sometimes joke that, uh, that there's no such thing as professor school because you get these jobs based on your ability to do research and to write about your research. Um, and uh, so the only thing that constitutes professor school in terms of teaching is the TA ships that you do yourself. So when was I a TA? I TA'd uh, a lab course for a full year as an undergraduate at Boston University. And that was uh, organic chemistry lab. Um, it was really fun. I had evening sections. Um, I was there with a, with a normal grad student TA um, at BU. There were so many undergrad chem majors that they actually allowed undergrad seniors to be TAs too. Um, and it, 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 was, it was fun. I, I, it really was one of the, the experiences that made me want to go into teaching. And two uh, lecture courses, those were uh, at Harvard. When I was a grad student, I TA'd a semester of organic chemistry and a semester of um, a science class or a nanoscience class for non-science majors called Invisible Worlds. Also a very positive experience. So what are some of the advantages? You get paid off your PI's books, that's an advantage. If, you are, if you're a good negotiator, you can say, I will TA this course if you get me this $15,000 piece of equipment that I need for my research. That gambit has worked on me before. It allows you to develop a relationship with a professor who's not your advisor. That's a really important thing because oftentimes we are in a PhD program for four to six years and the only professor we end up knowing when it comes time to apply for jobs is our own PI. Uh, and that's not such a good thing, right? Sometimes you have uh, committee members, but maybe you don't develop relationships with them because you only see them uh, a couple times, like the, maybe a second, fourth, and uh, your exams, and then your dissertation defense, and then, uh, then that's it. So how much of a relationship can you develop during that time? It also allows you to develop a better relationship with your advisor if the advisor is the professor of the course. Not all departments or advisors allow their own graduate students to TA their own classes, but in circumstances where this is allowed, it's often a good way to develop a stronger, uh, a stronger relationship with your, uh, with your PI to, to demonstrate your, uh, your uh, reliability and your, and your knowledge. Uh, actually, you, better, you develop a better relationship with your advisor, whether you teach for him or her or somebody else, um, because of uh, point number one on there. Uh, uh, it gives you a lot of practice. Uh, many of you, all of you, will be in roles where you will be mentoring others in, uh, in industry, academics, policy. There will always be a time, there will always come a time when new people come on board that you have to teach. And there are right and wrong ways to mentor these people. And this gives you a, uh, the TA ship gives you a nice framework for doing this. Gives you practice working with students in a more direct way if, um, if jobs in academia are your goal. It gives you experience public speaking. So public speaking is one of those things that is almost universally feared by people. And it's one of the hardest things to get over because you just have to do it. Just have to do it over and over and over and over again. And no matter how many times you do it, your pulse and blood pressure will always be higher than your pulse and blood pressure during your normal, uh, your normal everyday existence. Being a TA also helps you with time management. So research, uh, reading, uh, uh, your, uh, your, your activities that do not involve school at all and teaching all have to be arranged within a 24-hour day. 
It allows you to continue to learn. Um, sometimes our best experiences teaching are teaching classes that we had never taken as a student. I mean, that's pretty intimidating. Um, I can tell you having, uh, having taught as a professor several classes that I've never taken as a student, um, but, this, uh, but being a TA is actually especially uh, difficult in this regard, uh, but you end up being better off for it in the end, in my opinion. This is a key thing that I really hope out of all of the, uh, the, the nuggets of, of wisdom I, I hope to convey, uh, TAing allows you to see who the brightest and most enthusiastic students are in your, in your degree program, and you can invite them to join your research project as a trainee, and they will love it and you will be able to be more productive by recruiting students that you develop relationships with because of your, uh, your TA-ship. And then something important is that it gives you something different to do. <laughs> um, if we're just reading and writing and making PowerPoint slides and writing our experiments and doing our computer simulations and modeling all day, it gets sometimes a little tiring, sometimes you want to change the pace. And what's especially gratifying about being a TA and particularly the grading part of being a TA is that our lives as knowledge workers, that's kind of what we are, um, we're, we're knowledge workers. <laughs> um, we, we, we generate knowledge, we work with knowledge, we move knowledge around. The problem with knowledge work is that there's not generally an end point to knowledge work. It always keeps, it just keeps going. But have you ever had the experience of enjoying aspects of a job where once you're done, you're done. Once you've mowed the lawn, the lawn is mowed. <laughs> once you're done grading that giant stack of papers, that giant stack of papers is graded. Okay, how about some of the specifics of, uh, of being a TA? So you, our principal interactions as a teaching assistant with our students, um, this is the same for a professor actually, is in running office hours or, uh, or sections. So sometimes, depending on the course and what the, uh, and, and, uh, what the, what the instructor prefers, you can either have your, uh, your weekly scheduled meetings with students in addition to, uh, to email uh, appointments with students, email or, uh, arranged appointments with students, are through office hours or more formal sections. And uh, in this case, um, you, uh, the, the, the advice is to not hold your sections or office hours in the grad offices. One, uh, you need to be able to accommodate like 10 to 20 students or 50 students before an exam. Uh, and you generally can't do this in your grad student office. You'll also tend to annoy the other people in the grad student offices if people are constantly come, if students in your class are constantly coming to you uh, in the office. So my advice here is to get the professor to assign you a room, like Warren Lecture Hall in particular has smallish classrooms that hold 25 students uh, each one time a week. Uh, I find that in the uh, late afternoons on Thursdays and Fridays tend to work best for this. Um, and so you could ask the professor to arrange this room or you could, you could, uh, you could, find, you could ask the graduate coordinator um, who, who arranges TA ships and, uh, and the graduate courses uh, yourself. And they will work with scheduling and a few days later they'll find a, um, uh, a room for you to arrange your office hours. And I would do this before the class starts. So before, so before, the, uh, before the quarter starts, or in the first week or so of the quarter, I would get this request in. You'll find it's a lot easier to be able to write on a whiteboard or chalkboard um, uh, where you can walk around and engage with students as opposed to just kind of sitting in your office and waiting for people to come uh, to you. If you can't get a, uh, a classroom, find a common space. Uh, for example, structural engineering um, and nanoengineering and chemical engineering have access to the big outdoor, kind of quasi-outdoor atrium, but there are other common spaces in other buildings. Um, outdoors, uh, we live in San Diego. You can pretty much always go outside and hold office hours. I even sometimes hold my faculty office hours outdoors. Um, and uh, what to prepare ahead of time. 
or do you prepare ahead of time? Yes, uh, for office hours and, uh, and sections, definitely prepare ahead of time. Oh, uh, so when I was uh, teaching organic chemistry, um, we had these formal sections where the, the undergrad students were assigned to come to the TA sections. And so I had two TA sections per week and we had material that we had to go over. And we had a lot of control over what we could put in the, uh, in the, the notes for the section, but we had to cover some basic points from that week. And I always found that, so I had like a, like a 2 p.m. and a 3 p.m. section. And the 2 p.m. section uh, was, was rickety. It was, it was not my best work. Um, students were asking things that I hadn't anticipated. I wasn't very effective at this. Um, but then when the 3 p.m. section rolled around, which was just immediately following the one I just had, I was on top of the world. I, I had so much confidence. I could, I could anticipate what was going to be asked. I knew what all the pitfalls were going to be. Uh, and when I told this in our, our, our TA uh, uh, meeting, we had a professional instructor who was in charge of the TAs uh, for that course. And I told him this, uh, this, this anecdote. And I, and I thought, and, and I said, oh, you know, um, the, second, the second section just goes, um, uh, just goes really, really well. And, and I thought he would kind of be proud of me for, for correcting my errors. And he said, that means you were unprepared for the first section, which is true. I had no, no, no comeback to that. Uh, know what you're going to talk about ahead of time. Are you going to prepare your own material? So oftentimes the best thing about a TA is because they learned the subject more recently than the professor did, sometimes, <laughs> um, ideally. Um, and because of that, the, the teaching assistant is closer, they're, they're, they're closer in their, in their intellectual history to having learned the course material and they know where the pitfalls are going to be and therefore they're often better at explaining the material to a, someone who's learning it for the first time. So you can, uh, you can prepare your own material for, uh, for um, aspects of the course that you, that you, where you understand where the pitfalls are in a, in a, in, uh, in a circumstance where the professor might not understand where the pitfalls are because maybe they learned it 20 or 30 or 60 years ago. Uh, often, and you want to discuss this with the instructor, but often you will take questions about the homework or go over homework uh, problems. Or you could do it entirely by taking questions. Usually it's better to have some kind of structure to stimulate questions. Also, if you only take questions from the audience, or from the, the, the audience, from the class, uh, sometimes many of us have had the experience where there are maybe 10 people in a section or office hours, and somebody keeps asking questions that you know are minutia and not important um, for, uh, for the course. Maybe they're kind of important, but not as important as the key takeaways. Um, if you prepare ahead of time, you can steer the discussion toward areas that you feel are the most important uh, topics. And uh, after exams, uh, you sometimes will use this time to go over exams. How many of you have run a lab section before? Okay, many of you will run a lab section. Safety is our number one priority <laughs> in running a lab section. Uh, be familiar with the safety hazards before the lab section. I feel like, like a real adult going over this slide. Uh, be ruthless of your enforcement of personal protective equipment. Uh, this is more an issue in labs dealing with chemicals and biologicals, perhaps less so in CSE. So CSE people, bear with me for just a moment. Um, but anytime you have, uh, you have high, high, high voltages, um, uh, high powered equipment, be very, uh, be ruthless in your enforcement of um, gloves if appropriate or goggles if appropriate. Make sure you can do the lab yourself. 
uh, oftentimes, um, <laughs> oft oftentimes um, at least I found being a student, uh, and sometimes even being a TA, uh, perhaps when I did the practice round, I didn't actually get the thing to come out right. Um, and probably I should have stayed there until I did get the lab to come out right. Um, so, you know, this stuff seems obvious. Let me go back for a moment. Number one, number one priority is safety. Uh, one time we had um, this chemical uh, called lithium aluminum hydride, which uh, reacts, so it's, it's shipped as a powder, uh, but it's, it's in mineral oil because it can't come into contact with air. So if you leave it out and the oil kind of drips away or it gets rinsed off somehow and the lithium aluminum hydride reacts with water, the hydride, which is H minus, so a proton and two electrons, comes into contact with, uh, with the protons of water and reacts very exothermically. So we had a fire in a trash can. And when we told the TA, the TA took the nearest thing that was wet, which was a bottle of acetone, <laughs> and was two seconds away from pouring the acetone on the trash can fire until the students said, no, you idiot, that's acetone, don't do that. So then they found the, uh, the metal fire, yellow fire extinguisher, and put out the trash can fire that was caused by the lithium aluminum hydride. Okay, so don't assume, just don't assume sometimes you're TAing with another TA. Sometimes, especially in lab sections, you have two TAs in the lab section. You want to trust that person with your life, right? They, they should also know, you know, who's running who's steering this ship. Be aware of the pitfalls, safety, and technical, and try to assess understanding of the concepts as you walk around. So not just do they know what leads to plug into which sockets and what, uh, what, uh, how to manufacture a particular uh, device, but make sure that the students actually understand why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, and how do you know? You ask them. <laughs> you ask what are you doing? <laughs> Why is this stuff important? Uh, get to know the lab teams and the par and and the, the uh, and and the partnerships that uh, that form. Um, know who's. Uh, so sometimes the lab sections are three to four hours long. You have a lot of time with these people, so you have a, you have the opportunity to uh, to really behave as a mentor for them. To know which ones are. Um, uh, are, are pulling their weight and which ones are not. For example, sometimes lab partners in the, uh, in the lab section, one of them will do all the work. Probably if you are in, since you are all in graduate school, you were the ones that did all the work. <laughs> and then sometimes you had lab partners who didn't do anything and didn't read the pre-lab and didn't go to the lab lecture. And so uh, you can help uh, you can help these partnerships by identifying, like if someone's just standing around not doing anything, um, you can kind of encourage them. Feel free to interject extra knowledge uh, because you know, this, um, you, you know this topic and the students are learning it for the first time. You can be part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the educational enterprise by, by instilling a sense of, of excitement about the work um, and make it fun. Often lab sections are in the evening. Sometimes you'd really rather be, uh, be home doing something else, uh, but this is your opportunity to kind of, um, uh, uh, to, 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 sh to show off, to mentor, to do, um, to do uh, good things. Oh, and there's safety again, because it's so important. How do you assess the understanding of students? So here are some pictures of chimps and this guy. You can look at facial expressions. Don't assume in anything is easy. Uh, students in, uh, and humans in general won't usually betray their ignorance. A lot of times, even your PI, you'll go in for your weekly or monthly meeting and you'll say, I did this and this and this and this and this and this. And they'll say, uh-huh, 
Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Of course. Yeah. Mm, got it. Yep. Uh huh. And then at the end of the meeting, they'll ask you the most obvious question about the whole thing, and uh, and even though it was on every slide, uh, even your your professor might might just because they're they might be too embarrassed to uh, to say or they they feel like. Uh, like oh well, I'll just learn it later when the when the draft of the paper comes to my to my desk, uh, and then they'll say something that betrays their ignorance, and uh, and then you then it calls into question: Did did they understand anything that I said? Well, if professors do that, which we do, um, the undergrads that you have in your in your uh, office hours and in your lab sections will also do that. Will certainly do that. Um, so get them to do something other than head nodding and saying, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, I got it, got it, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Have, have them get sci coax scientific language from their mouths, and then you can, you can more accurately assess their understanding. Look at facial expressions. Sometimes in a section you see, um, you know, some, some some students are uh, are really have have a, this is a financial term, but they have a really high beta. So if they really if they don't understand something a little bit, they'll go. And so so even even if your even if your explanation is not quite up to up to par, and then you'll see a few people go. And then then you know that there are other people who are sitting there stoically, who also don't get it. Ask, ask if what you said makes sense, because uh, to it to uh, the, sometimes the, the minimum free energy in a in a group of students is to not say anything, right? Because they just don't want to speak up and appear dumb in front of everyone else, even if everyone else feels the same way that none of this makes sense. Uh, but if you if you ask or you give a little bit of yourself, like. I'm not sure if that explanation was the greatest. Are we on the same page? And people will actually respond to you. You can treat a section uh, as a discussion discussion leader. This, if the, if the students don't know this is coming, this is really hard to do in, a, in an engineering class or a math class or any science class of any of any natural science class of any time uh, of any kind. Um, you can use this method to find areas of weak understanding, and again, how? Ask the class if they get it. Uh, leave plenty of time for questions and have an inviting attitude. Try not to be intimidating to the extent possible. It's okay if you don't know the answer. It really is okay if you don't know the answer. Uh, students might get upset, but there's time, right? This, the office hour will be over eventually, and then you can go look it up. And that's how we learn and do better next time. Okay, this is something that, uh, that professors and TAs and teachers of all ages get wrong. Uh, they, they really have a lack of, of compassion and, uh, for the, for the, and empathy for the fact that the students are learning this for the first time. And so this guy wrote easy on the board. Okay, I made him write easy on the board. But you shouldn't say anything is easy. Compassion. Re recall that we all suffer from something called the curse of knowledge. It's really hard for us to internalize that others don't know what we know. That leads to a lot of uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Remember that your students are lear learning the material for the first time. Never tell them or let on that you're disappointed in them. <laughs> like, oh, the average on the exam was 55. I thought I taught you better than that. Don't say anything like that. Don't be tempted. Well, you can be tempted to say it, but have the scenario play out in your own mind. And then go to the minds of the students and think of how that, that would, would play in the mind of a student. Uh, so never, never tell your students that you're disappointed in them in class, office hours, or section, uh, on the homework, um, on, a, on a test. 
words never to use. Never say, this is easy. One time in the thermodynamics section of physical chemistry as an undergrad, my, uh, my professor would basically just say like, this is easy, this is straightforward, this is just what this is, and except 10 steps later that I didn't show. Never say obvious, pretty much in any context. Straightforward, books like this for some reason, books Textbooks say it's straightforward to show that blah, blah, blah. If you have to say something is straightforward, probably isn't. It's like quality food, somebody that advertises quality food. If you have to admit that there's some gradation in quality at your establishment, you probably shouldn't pick a point on that gradation. How many times have you seen straightforward in a textbook and had no idea what they were talking about? Just. Well, this is just this. Obviously, it's easy and straightforward. Sometimes you'll be asked to design homework problems. Sometimes this can be fun. I still kind of find this fun. Sorry those of you who are in my class right now. Um, assume that students will have access to all the old homework assignments from roommates, student organizations, club memberships, etc. This is controversial because some faculty members like to recycle everything. The problems must be new if they're going to be graded or count toward the student's course grade. Just saying don't use old materials is not sufficient. This type of cheating is actually the instructor's fault, human na nature such as it is. If an instructor recycles all of the exam problems from last year's exams, and half the class has access to it, and the other half doesn't, then that exam is compromised, and there is no way to enforce this. How on earth could you know which, I mean, are you going to, to, to accuse half the students who got 100 mysteriously on the exam because they saw last year's exams of cheating? No, what if there was a legit 100 in there? So this, uh, this is, Un, this is problematic behavior on the part of people writing exam problems. If the homework problems are recycled, they can't be due for a grade. You can't blame the bear for eating the honey. Human nature, bear nature, such as it is. And there's Pooh Bear. Oh, Paula. There are some bears too. <laughs> and there's a not so nice bear. <laughs> Designing exams. Uh, everything I said about the homework applies here as well. In a perfect world, exam problems would be completely new for every exam. However, after many years of teaching the same concepts in the same book with the same set of notes over and over again, there are only so many ways you can reconfigure an exam to test the same stuff. But that's okay, you just gotta try a little harder. <laughs> At the very least, if you're, going to, if you're going to reuse, if you're gonna think about reusing exam problems, don't actually reuse them. Take the same structure, make sure it's more than two years old at least, Change the, ch change the scenario in the problem, if not the structure, and for God's sakes, change the numbers at least. If cubes are pretty nice. Spheres are pretty nice too.
Make sure the problem and your solution key is reviewed by at least one other person before printing. The last thing you want is to, to print off 150 exams and have a critical error in one of the problems. Because how does this look to a student? This is also incidentally advice to all of my faculty colleagues as well. Um, how does it look to a student if you get up in front of the class, and I've done this like, I don't know, five times. I did it on the last exam I gave out where there was a typo. It wasn't a serious typo, I don't think. Uh, but so, so the first thing you get up, like I'm judging all of you and this is 25% of your grade, but I made a mistake on this exam and here it is. Use a printing service like imprints or for our viewers on the internet, an equivalent of imprints. Uh, get an index number from the professor that you can use toward photocopying. Um, and you get from imprints, you get your order in 24 hours or your pizza's free. Don't be a sucker and copy, photocopy all your own stuff. There are people who are professional, get the staple exactly to within two microns of tolerance on every single packet. It's great, use a professional for this. Grading, make exams easy to grade. If you saw my talk on teaching last, uh, last year, there is a little bit of repetition, but I'll have some, some different words, different words will come out. Make exams easy to grade uh, or use an easy grading scheme. Uh, you don't want this to take forever because grading can take forever. Make it a game, make it a goal of spending no more than 30 seconds on each problem while maintaining absolute consistency. Grade the lab reports fairly if you're, if you're TAing a lab section. If there's no rubric, ask for one. If the professor doesn't have one, make a rubric yourself and write it all out ahead of time so that you're exactly consistent. We've all been in a scenario where two students come to you or one student comes to you, my friend got this marked off and you didn't mark this off. My, my friend got, got points for this and I got marked off for that. You know, what gives? It's exactly the same. Chances are there's something else that's not quite the same about those two papers, but oftentimes uh, they have a point and it's because we didn't use a consistent uh, grading rubric. So be very, uh, you know, don't make your life unnecessarily stressful. A lot of times these uh, issues that come up in, in teaching can really cost us a lot of heartbeats and, uh, and, uh, and sleep if you get accused of, of, uh, of grading unfairly. Make the key available so you can write the score only. So don't correct, don't write the right answer out. Don't write the full solution with everything out on every single exam paper. If the solution key is posted afterwards, all you have to do is write the, num the number of points. Grade in red pen. So in uh, there, I had a, a professor in grad school who graded in blue or green ink. And the thought was, Red is very harsh, it's very harsh for students to see things graded in red. It's like blood, it's like anger. Green is nice. So they graded everything in green. And while they had the skill to differentiate a dark green pen from a pencil or a pen mark after already grading 199 exams, more power to them but I couldn't do this. I tried it the first, in 2012, I taught Nano 202 for the first time and I thought, I'm gonna, that sounds like good advice. I'm gonna grade in green pen. And then I added up the points wrong in like six people's exams out of a class of 30. Incidentally, this is green. Give students the benefit of the doubt curved anyway, so who cares? Just give them the points. <laughs> Don't announce a regrade policy. Uh, if you announce a regrade policy, one time I announced a regrade policy. My regrade policy is always the same whether I announce it or not. If a student 
thinks that there's an error, like an actual error, not unfairness, but an actual error in grading the exam. And they write a note on a separate piece of paper and hand it in to me or the TA for me and the TA to review in the quiet of our office. Um, that's the regrade policy that I use. Um, I don't do this, this weird thing that some faculty members do where they say, you can ask for a regrade, but I'm going to regrade the whole exam. So if you get points there, you might get, you might, you might lose points somewhere else. Like, wow, this is the most inconsistent grading I've ever, <laughs> and you're going to admit that there might be other errors in the grading. Um, no, I'm not going to look at the whole exam. I'm just going to look at that one part of that one problem. If there is a bank error in your favor, collect $100 somewhere else. Good for you. Uh, and, um, but I won't discuss it because I don't want to get into an argument about, about, a, about losing usually some tiny number of points on some exam. So, uh, so you go over it with the TA. You decide if it was consistent, not is three points a lot to take off for a math error instead of two. Go with the consistent answer. The consistent answer is the right one. Uh, so one time I announced my regrade policy and a student came up to me right after the exam and, and he said, um, I heard that we can fight for points. <laughs> like, and I said, no, you may not fight for anything. We're not fighting for anything. Uh, don't discuss it with the students. Have them submit the request in writing. Take the exam from them. Don't just write don't just change the number on, on the cover sheet and expect that you're going to remember to enter it into your spreadsheet later because half the time you won't. And then they'll add up their own points at the end of the exam and they'll get their final course grade and then challenge the course grade. And you really don't want that to happen. Okay, a few... Uh, few Pointers on lecturing. So lecturing, this could be a section. I don't mean a standard lecture. I could, this could be office hours with five or 10 students. Err on the side of loudness and speak clearly. To strengthen your vocal cords, you may want to sing in your car or on the bus. Begin each lecture with a monologue recapping what we did before and how it ties into today, perhaps an example or application. Students respond differently to professional clothing, especially if the lecturer looks too young. <laughs> you look too young to be teaching me anything. Well, I'm five to 15 years older than you. What I say goes. Otherwise, students may want to give you advice on teaching, which is unwelcome. Uh, be human, and if you have a sense of humor, use it. What's acceptable is, uh, is to, to be funny or to be awkwardly not funny is still kind of funny. <laughs> Unacceptable is barely funny, like if it just smacks of effort or if it's creepy. Esoteric jokes are my favorite. Um, they're the ones that two or three people in the audience just, just do some ROFLing. Uh, and then no one else gets. And then I know I've reached somebody. Um, the Crayola, thin Crayola chalk sucks. Buy some Hagoromo chalk available on Amazon. If you have a whiteboard, never touch the whiteboard with your finger. You know the whiteboards that don't erase? It's not the whiteboard's fault. It's all the sebaceous gland secretions that have accumulated on the whiteboard, which is why you need special chemicals to wipe them down. All right, sometimes, sometimes there's a crisis and we get called out for something that we don't know. Most people, including professors, TAs, anybody, lose mental alacrity when speaking in front of 10 or more conscious judging beings. The depth of uh, your knowledge does not maintain a constant distance from the level of your presentation. You can't expect it to be know every topic equally well. So you know how um, during election season, 
like CNN has that asinine thing at the bottom where they have these this focus groups of Democrats and Republicans and they turn a dial when they say something they like they turn the dial I like that when they say something they, they don't they turn the dial the other way and then you have these plots I don't know if they still do this it's like that puck highlighting thing they used to have in hockey uh, broadcasts I don't know if they still do that either but anyway like five years ago they used to have the oh, oh the Democrat said something good the Republican and then the other way around and then uh, oh they, they, they agreed on something yeah. Same thing is kind of true in teaching, where here's the level of your presentation, and here's the level of your depth of understanding. Now, ideally, it's like this the whole time, but that's never how it is, is it? Sometimes you're like here, and it fluctuates, and sometimes you, you're like this, and you flatline. And during these periods, that's when if a student asks a question, you have no idea beyond what you already put on the board. Sometimes we, those are our most vulnerable moments when we're presenting exactly what we know about the topic and we don't know anything else. What if that happens? First, you don't want to be here that much, right? <laughs> you don't, that goes without saying. But we're all human and uh, we have a million other things to do. What if you don't know the answer to a question? So there are three sort of types of questions that fall into this category. A student asks for depth or an example of an application, and you can just say, uh, that's a great question. I don't know, I'll find out for you. Please see, send me an email to remind me. What if the student asks something about the course material, like a derivation? What if you put the derivation on the board? And what if they say, where did that factor of two come from? I don't understand where that came from. If you've done a derivation on the board, maybe you do the same derivation, maybe you taught the class last year and you really knew it then and it's in your notes and I'm just going to write it down again and but I didn't go through the sweat, the, uh, the, 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 the difficult uh, process of relearning exactly where everything came from. You didn't solve all the integrals again, you didn't draw out the geometry of the problem again, and in the heat of the moment, you just don't, uh, you just don't know. So uh, if you have a book, you can give them a page number, but you, can also, you should also go, I'll find out for you, please send me an email. If you wanna be a smart ass, you can say this. Sometimes it's true. Okay, don't say that. Uh, students, what if, what if the student asks you something about, you wrote on the board uh, that you just can't explain? Like, really minimize the probability of number three happening. Uh, but what if you do know? But what if you're really nervous and you forget? What if you really do know if people weren't just staring at you if the clock wasn't ticking and people weren't staring at you, judging you, you'd be able to figure it out. And maybe you did know before somebody took you to task in front of everybody, um, because that does, that does happen. And we have mental lapses. And in that case, your best bet is to say, I understand the question, I just can't see it right now. Don't lie, don't make something up. Um, I'll send an email to the class right after we're done. And you're going to remember to do it because scenario three is really embarrassing. And thank them for your patience with you. Okay, uh, if you want more information about this, I would encourage you to reach, reach out to me on the web. I have all of these lectures on YouTube. I've done uh, lots of them by now. Ironically, the one about presentations is very poorly presented. So I'm going to redo that one. So if you're going to watch any of them, do that one later. Um, and uh, I should say that, all right, I'm going to turn the camera off before we take uh, questions.